is 1944. Warsaw has almost been occupied for five years under Nazi occupation. From as early as May, Soviet aircraft dropped leaflets over the city calling the Poles to fight against their German oppressors. The German army is weakening and may well retreat under Soviet incursion into Poland. Operation Tempest, a counter-strike in Poland against German forces has begun in parts of the country. On July 26th, the Polish government in exile declare the uprising is authorized from Warsaw. German movements begin to move away from the east of the city. The Polish resistance in Warsaw lie in wait. On July 27th, the Germans, reinforced, begin to further their fortifications of the city. The Russians are coming. Ludwig, Fick, Ludwig Fischer, the German governor of Warsaw, orders 100,000 of the city's inhabitants to help the Germans build fortifications against the Russians. Russian radio broadcasts with calls to arms to the Polish forces begin. Antony Kruschel, or Monta, orders mobilization of the Polish forces. On July 28th, the city ignores the order. There is no retaliation from the Germans at this point. In response to this, General Bohr commands Mont countermands Monta's order, which causes some confusion in the Home Guard ranks. And on July 31st, movement is detected in the east. The Russians are coming. Bohr decides now is the time for the uprising. August 1st, at 10 a.m., the sirens in the city wail. People do not know what the sirens are for. The Polish language newspapers, which are known as the reptile news, as they are controlled by the Germans, are not distributed in Warsaw. 1.50 p.m. some clashes between Germans and insurgents begin. 2 p.m. tram activity in the city is halted. At 4.30 p.m. Jan Novak arrives at the insurgents headquarters, 22 Jasna Street. At 5 p.m. the rising begins. This is known as W Hour and to this day 5 p.m. on the 1st of August is met by sirens and a minute's silence in Poland. The Polish forces are split into eight subdivisions to take different parts of the city. Initially, the Polish attacks are quite successful and they gain much of control over the city of Warsaw, though they fail to capture the more fortified German positions, areas such as the past skyscraper, the bridges across the Vistula and the Saxon Palace. This meant that there was no central stronghold or line of communication established between the Polish forces. Many forces also had to retreat to the surrounding forests or go underground to evade German retaliation. Then, between the 5th and the 7th of August, the Bola massacre takes place. From August the 5th, the German army, uh, reinforced, sent three attack groups along Volska and Gorzuska streets. Their advance was halted, but 
However, they proceeded with orders behind the newly established German lines and went from house to house and shot all inhabitants they found. By the 8th of August, they had murdered possibly 100,000 people. This wasn't just insurgents, this was civilians. Anyone who was in those houses. People that weren't directly involved in the conflict. The main perpetrators of this were Oskar Derlevanger and Bronislav Kaminsky. The policy was designed to crush the Poles' will to fight and put the uprising to an end without having to commit to heavy cities, commit to heavy city fighting. However, this actually led to a stiffened Polish resistance. On the 7th of August, the uh, Wyskawica, uh, long-range radio transmitter was assembled. The first message broadcast by Zbigniew Sviantakowski uh, uh, was the following. Hello, here is Briskavica speaking, a radio transmitter of the Home Army in Warsaw. On 32.8 and 52.1 meter bands. The spirit of Warsaw is wonderful. The women of Warsaw are wonderful. They are everywhere, in the front line together with soldiers, as nurses or liaison officers. Even children are animated by the wonderful spirit of bravery. We greet all freedom-loving people of the world. Polish soldiers who fight in Italy, Polish pilots, and mariners. Now this broadcast, as well as boosting the morale of the troops, was also designed to kind of intimidate the German forces and was very much directed at the Wehrmacht. It's worth to note that the Polish fighters were counting on Soviet forces launching their assaults on Warsaw within three to five days at the start of the uprising. However, the Soviets uh, had a rather slow approach and even when they did eventually do their advance through the eastern district of Praga, they stopped short at the Vistula and didn't really do anything to aid the Polish forces. There were some limited airdrops uh, by Allied forces, particularly from Great Britain and South Africa. However, most of these drops didn't necessarily reach the Polish forces and perhaps came a bit late um, into the activities. It's also worth noting that Stalin had refused the use of Soviet airfields to the Allies meaning that the quantity of supplies that could be carried for each airdrop was very limited. The Polish forces did have some help um, from several hundred people of non-Polish nationality within the city. These were mostly escaped POWs and those that were just caught in the city by the spell of fate. They all wore the Polish armband as the insurgents did at the time. The Polish side also suffered heavily from food source shortages. They did manage to capture the Haberbush in E. Uh, Shield Brewery and they used the grain, uh, so the barley, um, to help to feed the inhabitants of the town. But as they weren't prepared for kind of such a lengthy siege, the people did begin to starve. There was heavy fighting throughout the city. Uh, many buildings were destroyed. Um, you know, children were fighting, women were fighting. Everyone was fighting for their lives, trying to protect their city, trying to gain ground 
against the German forces. <coughs> and <coughs> the Poles even managed to capture a couple of the German tanks, a couple of the Panzer Division, which they used against them in the fighting. However, they were severely under-equipped compared to the German forces, and so were very much launching an uphill struggle. Between the 9th and the 18th of August, uh, the fighting uh, was particularly heavy um, in the Old Town. And sadly, the Poles, no matter how valiantly they fought, how much soul they had, they eventually had to retreat from the German forces. And by the 2nd of September, anyone who hadn't been captured effectively had escaped. Now, when the Poles were launching their kind of escapes um, in, in the city, they primarily used the sewer system. And this was a tactic, you know, to evade the German forces. It was a rather successful tactic, even though well, let's be honest, you know, crawling through the sewers isn't exactly uh, fun. Um, you know, it wasn't the easiest of journeys, but it was an essential one. And when you're in the resistance, you have to use every tactic that you can. Between the 7th and the 10th of September, there were some brief peace talks you know, prompted by uh, General Ruhr. However, these broke down on the 11th uh, when there was news that the Soviets were advancing through Praga. Though during this time, 20,000 civilians were evacuated um, from the, the, you know, the worst areas. And the Home Guard, the Polish uh, main forces, were recognized as military combatants and, you know, such should be treated by the Geneva Convention. On the 13th of September, the German forces destroyed the last remaining bridges across the Vistula, mainly to halt the Russian advance, though I believe the Russians were quite content to stay in the Praga district of Warsaw. On the 14th, however, the Polish forces managed to take the eastern bank of the Vistula. But between the 15th and the 23rd, they met heavy resistance from the German forces, who, of course, naturally retook the position in the process, destroying the Polish boats uh, that were in play there, as well as preventing them from making any further crossings by destroying any other equipment they had which was being used to cross the river. On the 18th of September, Stalin finally allowed American airdrops to take place over the city. So some 107 uh, flying fortresses dropped 100 tons of supplies over the city. But most of this didn't reach the Polish forces. And in fact, was way too late in the conflict to make much of a difference. The Soviets even accused the Americans of aiding the Germans. You have to love the propaganda that goes on from that part of the world. The Soviets also made airdrops between the 13th and the 30th of September, but they didn't use parachutes on their airdrops. So even though they dropped a lot of ammunition, small arms, these were pretty much destroyed if they even reached the Polish forces. So again, not particularly useful. On the 20th of September, uh, the eight subdivisions of the Polish forces, you know, reorganized themselves into three subdivisions in order to consolidate their power and to hold on to the main Polish strongholds that were still going. 
But by the 28th of September, the Polish-German peace talks resume. By the 30th, uh, Jolibosch, a uh, rather central area of the city, is retaken by the Germans. And on the 2nd of October, the Polish forces surrender. They capitulate uh, to the Germans. The people were hungry. The army was outnumbered. They'd suffered heavy losses. They had no other option at this point. They hadn't been backed up by the Russians. They hadn't had the support from the West that they'd expected. At this point, they pretty much were let down on all sides and had no other choice. As per the capitulation agreement, the insurgents lay down their arms and leave the city in tight formations with their commanders. Civilians are also made to leave the city. Home army soldiers are deported to numerous POW camps, a lot of them within Germany. Civilians are split between forced labor camps, concentration camps, while others are sent to Radom, apologies, and Krakow. Some people in Poland now would probably say being sent to Radom is the worst thing that can happen. But that's a Polish joke. Um, over 18,000 insurgents and 180,000 civilians are killed during the conflict. At least this is the prediction. Nobody knows the exact numbers, um, but this is widely thought is the kind of tally uh, that the conflict actually brought. Warsaw is then systematically bombed, you know, with a great deal of it being destroyed already, the Germans continued their plan of obliteration. Apparently this is actually something they planned to do before the war. Historically, Warsaw had stood in the way of um, German expansion throughout history through the different regimes, and so it was quite a cultural symbol um, against Germany, and they were all too happy to destroy it. By the end of the bombing, only 64 out of 987 historical buildings remain. And by the 1st of January, 85% of the city is destroyed. And within the wider Poland, their spirit of independence is broken and the country is led more towards communist rule. And this was further solidified by the results of the conference between the USA, Great Britain and the Soviet Union at Yalta, which pretty much put Poland, what remained of it after the Second World War, under Soviet control. There is often debate on this issue, where some people feel very abandoned by the West and rather horrified that they were, uh, you know, left for Soviet rule. There's also the argument that the government at the time also bent that way. And, you know, this is the result that happened. But this is a continuing debate as to how much the West is to blame versus self-interest. In total, the uprising lasted for 66 days and actually provided one of the most notable city battles in human history. This event was epic. The number of people who died was insane. The cruelty on display, the remorseless attacks by the SS. This was a disaster. And one that was very much downplayed 
afterwards, you know, especially by the Soviet press, by the UK press. Nobody wanted to accept what had happened to I very much recommend anyone who visits Warsaw to go to the Warsaw Uprising Museum. It's one of the first places I uh, went to visit uh, when, I, when I arrived here and it is eye-opening. I've been twice now and honestly there's so much to see and a lot of the clips uh, I provided through tonight's uh, video have come directly from that museum, so I'm hoping they don't mind. <laughs> um, it's only about 20 zloty to enter. Uh, and if you are lucky, you might get free entry. I think that sometimes you have that on Sundays. But honestly, this is a massive chapter of World War II, which I didn't know about. Um, until I moved here and uh, it's something that should very much be told in the history books in a big way. On that note, I want to thank you for watching. Um, I hope you have found this educational and honestly if you haven't heard about this before I hope you found it shocking as well because it truly was. I will try to tell more stories about Polish history as I go on and as I become more confident to tell these stories. Thank you very much for watching. Please like and subscribe if you'd like to see more.